Can, can you hear me now? <laughs> Better. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm honored to stand here today to welcome all of you to this celebration of the 60th anniversary of the establishment of what is known today as the UCLA Department of Information Studies. For those who don't know me, I'm Marcelo Suarez Orozco, the UCLA Wasserman Dean of Education and Information Studies. And I am simply delighted to be here this afternoon in this wonderful, wonderful occasion. As we say in the old country, Feliz Cumpleaños. <laughs> in 1958, when our wise UCLA ancestors, leaders, set out to create a school of library service, they could have never envisioned the role of information professionals in 2018. What started with a sharp focus, mostly on libraries, has now grown, broadened, to encompass every aspect of information and data management across every sector of society. I don't know another area of study at this, the great public research university in the world, that has grown so exponentially in such a short period of time. My congratulations to each and every one of you for you are the very individuals shaping the information age as it evolves today and moving forward. The areas of expertise represented here are broad, interesting, fundamental. Children's services data management, archiving the stories of people fleeing violence and dictatorships. I'm one of those. Museums and metadata, algorithmic bias of internet search engines, academic libraries, digital video on police cams, rare books, film and sound archiving, and on and on. Never mind. <laughs> That's better. You are a remarkable group of individuals who together are at the forefront of theory, research, and practice in the most fundamental matters to our democracy today. Information, engagement, data, facts, citizenship, a fundamental pillar of democracy in our troubled times. I want to take a moment to congratulate you all on the collective and persistent focus on the importance of the diversity in the information professions. UCLA Information Studies is known worldwide 
for its excellence, for its ethics, and it is also known as a community, perhaps the community, that cares most about issues of justice and a community that welcomes the richness and wealth of knowledge and experience that comes with diversity. As we look towards the future and being a place of excellence for the next 60 years, UCLA Information Studies is set to grow and evolve in more ways as well as to build upon our extraordinary current strengths. We can clearly see, it's obvious, that every sector of society, every corporation, every library, archives, museums, every institution fundamental to the workings of democracy will need information professionals to help shape and guide policies and practices on information creation, pres preservation, and access. Young people in our K-12 schools will need the information and data and managing management skills that are foundational for a 21st century rounded educational experience for all our citizens. UCLA Information Studies today is a vibrant and exciting place to work. To prepare for the future, I was delighted and honored to have the opportunity to create the new Associate Dean for Information Studies position as part of our school's leadership structure. And as many of you know, I'm delighted that Dr. Ann Gilliland recently accepted my offer to take on this vital role. Anne is an extraordinary, uh, smart, wise, and globally respected scholar who has a clear vision of the work we need to engage moving forward. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Gillilan on her new appointment. And, and Dr. Johanna Drucker, our interim chair of the department, will speak after lunch, and then you will be treated to a keynote address from Professor Sarah Roberts. Sarah is an exploding nova of brilliance in this firmament with many, many such novas. Clearly a star who is rapidly becoming one of the most influential scholars on another foundational issue in our democracy today, and that is the domain pertinent to content moderation on the internet. I am delighted to share with you that Sarah was just named a Carnegie Fellow, a highly prestigious and coveted award. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Roberts. No pressure. <laughs> the best is yet to come. Last but not least, I want to name the extraordinary team in external relations. Our leadership uh, standing, please join me in uh, sharing our gratitude 
to the team that makes the work of information studies so relevant, so significant in our endeavors to share the good news that information studies at UCLA is vibrant and it is changing our world. The external relations team. Quiero darles una palabra de agradecimiento a todos los compañeros que están sirviendo nuestra comida hoy and want to thank them for the wonderful hospitality with which they are uh, doing the work of feeding our bodies and our souls. Thank you so much. All the workers of the UCLA Now, last but not least, I want to thank our volunteer alumni leadership, those who serve on the board of LISA, the Library and Information Studies Alumni Association. You, our alumni, proud Bruins who contribute your time your expertise, your love of UCLA to help build all events and programs that are such an important part of our community. Will all members of the board who are with us this afternoon please stand up for a round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do. Muchas, muchas gracias. A comer. Thank you. Okay, I hope that uh, everybody enjoyed their lunch. Um, I, I, it's a pity to interrupt you because you all seem to be having such a good conversation with each other. Um, I was just thinking this morning, it, it just seems like it was yesterday when we were having our 50th anniversary and on that day we were on the rooftop of Fowler um, Museum and it was boiling hot. And today it's not quite so hot. Um, so, anyway, I don't want to take up too much of your time here today, but I did want to add my welcome to all of you who are here. Um, some of you are old friends, alums, and former faculty, and, and some who are current students, faculty, and staff in our programs. And uh, I just want to say, too, that we have fantastic staff in the Department of Information Studies, and we really couldn't do what we do um, without them. Our alums are spread far and wide and are doing phenomenal work as librarians and archivists and information architects and legal information specialists, uh, digital humanities um, specialists, also as information studies faculty. This is today as well the um, 40th anniversary of our PhD program and I think we may have placed more doctoral students in academic positions around North America than any other program. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, and of course, and many of you are in a, an information specialty that I haven't listed here because there are far too many um, to list and Marcella did a pretty good job earlier as well. Um, and you know, as Marcella noted, these are important times for the information fields, um, the kinds of um, fields that our programs and our alums represent and the services and insight that they provide to communities here in Los Angeles and globally. In fact, these fields have been important, they've always been important, but I think the importance of them has been recognized for decades now, um, given the ever-evolving and expanding information, media, and communications world, and all of the new accessibilities and opportunities that it affords. Um, but I did want to note that today the information fields are particularly important for another reason. 
because it is their challenge and their responsibility to respond knowledgeably, innovatively, critically, equitably, compassionately, and with agility and strong voices to the many challenges to equity, to access, to accountability, and to the reliability of the information that we manage that have emerged in this country and around the world. The Information Studies Department has um, a, a rather um, distinctive and incredibly important commitment to equity, to social justice, and to the many and diverse communities that make up Los Angeles and the country. And above all, to professional, critical, and empirical excellence um, in, in the fields. And this positions it, and it positions its students and its alums and its faculty very well to ch tackle these challenges head on. Today, um, after lunch and after our wonderful keynote speaker today, um, you're going to hear about the work of a number of these individuals, our master students, our doctoral students, um, our faculty. This work is exciting, it's meaningful, and it clearly demonstrates how broad the range of professional and research engagements in information studies can and needs to be. As we enter a period now of planning for an expanded department, with new educational initiatives and research units, I wanted to provide just three examples of how this will build upon the department's renowned history of professional and intellectual leadership. And I could have picked many, many more. I started to list them all out, and then I realized I'm not supposed to be up here that long, so, so <laughs> I'm, just going to, I'm just going to pick out three. And the first one of those is that information studies is known worldwide um, as a program that has always valued and pioneered in the organization of knowledge and particularly in bibliographic control and the epistemological foundations of knowledge representation. Um, I, you know, I am an archives person, so just to give you a little bit of history here, Seymour Lubetsky in 1953 articulated his principles and theory of cataloging, and it was his work that underlay the International Conference on Cataloging in 1961 that resulted in the articulation of the Paris principles that really guided the development of international cataloging standards. <coughs> Lubetsky joined the UCLA faculty and he continued to write right up until he passed away in 2003. And just to tell you, he was 104 at that point, or almost 104, a few days short of it. It is a good life, and you know, being a cataloger keeps you strong and healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Recipe for a good life, yes. Um, Elaine Sononius, who joined the UCLA faculty in the 1980s, similarly belongs in the pantheon of cataloging and knowledge organization, particularly with her book, The Intellectual Foundation of Information Organization, which is still recommended reading for students of cataloging everywhere. Today, we continue to offer perhaps an even wider range of courses in knowledge organization, in subject and descriptive cataloging, metadata, and archival moving image and museum description. And two of our faculty, Professors Jonathan Ferner and Greg Lisa, together with doctoral program alumnus and assistant professor at the University of Indiana, Rob Montoya, are working on a new initiative to develop a research center and network of scholars in knowledge organization that will be based in the Department of Information Studies. The department has also been known for the groundbreaking work of its information scientists, among them Robert Hayes, who was the dean of the program and who I believe we will see later on in the day, Marcia Bates, who is here today. And I don't know, Marcia, do you want to stand up? And Yay! And also Christine Borgman. Um, it, it's really important, I think, to, to, to note here that both Marcia and Christine hold the distinction of being among the most cited figures in the history of information science, something that is particularly notable, notable when you consider that this was until recently a strongly male-dominated field. Marcia and Chris both continue to be prolific scholars 
even though they have chosen to retire from active duty within the department, but still stay in close touch with us. However, we are also really thrilled to have an amazing cohort of younger faculty who are taking information science and informatics and technology in new directions. And here I want particularly to note Sarah Roberts and Sophia Noble's work separately and together um, in critical internet studies, an area that we also hope to develop into a new center here in information studies. Finally, and uh, I know I'm not allowed really to brag about my own area, <laughs> but I, I really want to acknowledge the groundbreaking work that has been done here um, by IS faculty and alums in the area of archives and also media archives studies. It was 23 years ago when we initiated a specialization here in archival studies. And um, our alums have truly, um, sorry, uh -huh. Our alums have truly taken the archives world by storm. You're going to hear today about another exciting new development in the department that builds on its track record. The Community Archives Lab, which is headed by Professor Michelle Caswell, who leads a team of student researchers that is now pre a preeminent or the preeminent source of scholarship and outreach on community archives in the world. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention in the same vein two really important cross-institutional and, and um, cross-community collaborations that have occurred in Los Angeles um, through the work of our Archives alums. One being the LA the Subject Initiative and its amazing sponsorship also of the annual Archives Bazaar, and, which is held at the University of Southern California. And the second being the LA Archivist Collective, which was founded in 2014 and now has a membership of more than 300 plus archivists, librarians, students, and information professionals that are providing amazing archival outreach to local communities um, through education, um, facilitating connections to local resources, and promoting general archival awareness. Um, as I said, I could spend the whole day bragging about the work of our community and of um, our alums um, out in the greater community. Um, I don't have all day. Um, my job now is to um, welcome Professor Johanna um, Drucker to the program. Um, Johanna is the interim chair of the Department of Information Studies and the incoming chair in September when she comes back from a residency in Yale. And I'm really, really pleased to have her on board. So thank you. Thanks so much, Anne, and thanks, Marcelo. And we're all looking forward to Sarah's talk, so I will be very brief. Um, I'm sort of the in-between uh, in many ways these days. Uh, I feel it keenly. Um, so uh, in that role, however, I did want to note that Anniversaries and birthdays are interesting things. We do know the date of birth. We often do not know the date of conception or gestation. And that is the case with our department and our school as well. It took a long time for this little puppy. Um, and uh, Lawrence Clark Powell, who was a local fellow and went to Oxy, um, was interested in, oh yeah, here's a word we haven't heard much, books. And, um, and he was very interested in books and actually helped to foster, oh, fine printing and, you know, letterpress in uh, Southern California as part of his career. But um, Powell was working at Oxy and uh, a bright, a very, uh, you know, sort of uh, visionary librarian looked at him and said, young man, you should go to library school. Sent him up to Berkeley, oh yeah, Berkeley, um, in 1927. And Powell came back and worked at the LA Public Library, 1927. So like with this date about, you know, 1968, a lot's gonna happen in 40 years. So Powell um, uh, had a colleague, it was actually a colleague of his father's, Edward Dixon, 
And Dixon had in mind that there should be a school of the library. And he started to have this idea in the 1930s. And they talked about it, it seemed like a great idea, but political circumstances were not good, economic circumstances were not good. Uh, Powell became the librarian at UCLA, uh, as well as at the Clark at that time, the two were joined together. Um, and it was around 1946 that an assembly bill, Assembly Bill 35, went through the California Assembly, sponsored by Governor Warren, and it included money for a med school. Oh, <laughs> fine. Dixon, who was a politician and part of the California Assembly, said, we want all the professions to be represented at UCLA, all the professions. And so this kind of conversation went on for another, I mean, we're talking 1946 at that point. It's going to take another 20 years, that's, you know, to get this project to actually happen. In 1947, Powell, who was here, created special collections at UCLA. Um, and in 1948, a survey was put together that was a report of the survey of needs of California in higher education. And the question posed by the survey was, do we need more librarians? And the answer was no. <laughs> what we need is better salaries for the librarians we already have. All right, so that's an interesting notion, but the sense was no, more librarians were not yet needed. Now, there was a library school at USC, and then there was one at Immaculate Heart, and the questions of whether another, whether Southern California could support another library school were debated among various persons for quite some time. And in 1951, President Sproul, the head of the UC system, um, asked Robert Lay to do a survey and find out, did we need another library school? Was it necessary? Would it be useful? Um, and uh, so uh, the city librarian in Los Angeles, Harold Hamill, uh, said to Regent Dixon, yes, we have an immediate need. We really do need another uh, library school. So the uh, project went on. Powell sent a budget to Governor Brown, Edmund uh, Brown at that point, in 1956, and said, here it is, here's the budget. Now you know when you're doing budgets, you're getting real. Anybody who's ever applied for grants knows if you're at that level and they're asking you for how you're gonna spend money, that they're serious about you. And the same is true with governors. So here's Powell sending his budget. And uh, in 1958, the regents um, uh, approved the budget and the library school was given license to go ahead along with a school of architecture and a school of dentistry. All right, and here we are. Um, the, one of the first hires that uh, Powell made um, was, of course, Robert Hayes. Um, and interesting, a mathematician by training. And again, thinking about the diversity of backgrounds that contribute um, to this field. We can say that, yes, indeed, many things could not have been foreseen. But 1958, tech, you know, technology of post-war um, data science was very definitely on the horizon and on the rise. And the understanding that, um, you know, library schools were also going to be schools of information was certainly, you know, at least a twinkling in the eye of these folks. Um, Andrew Horn, one of the first professors of our school, was um, lured away by Powell from um, uh, Occidental, and he did a whole bunch of work on, on guess what, accreditation. I could have used him in the last few weeks. Um, and, uh, and he also is the person who started to engineer the curriculum and to think about what should, a, what should the curriculum of the library school look like. And um, it was his idea that it should be bibli bibliography and book-centered, so I'm not so sorry about that, but they also began to expand and think about the broader needs um, within the uh, you know, state of California and higher ed and the professions more broadly. And so here we are, um, many years uh, later. All of the notes on which I've just made these remarks are from the work of Christine Curley, who was a master's student of ours a couple of years ago and did a fantastic study of the origins of the school. So thank you, Christine, for your terrific work. There's really no greater privilege that we have than that of working with our students. It is such an honor and such a terrifically rewarding experience. And I thank you for being here, alums, students, fellow faculty, staff. Um, I'm pleased now to be able to turn the podium over to our exploding Nova. <laughs> and, uh, and that is Sarah Roberts, whose remarks I think will be uh, pertinent and timely and invigorating. Thank you all.
great. Folks, I, um, I've been rendered speechless by the kind words of my colleagues and of the Dean. Um, I'm so grateful to have been asked to speak with you today uh, as one of the newest members of the faculty of the department uh, in my third year. Uh, I had spent three years prior at, at uh, Western Ontario and uh, had the incredible good fortune of leaving the snow behind. So I'm very <laughs> pleased to be here in California. Uh, although I also uh, gambled on the 2016 presidential election and uh, uh, here we are. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, <sighs> You know, I was remarking to a friend this morning that uh, as someone who speaks frequently about, uh, about my research and uh, the, the kinds of engagements that I'm invested in uh, academically quite fre frequently, it's been a long time since I had the jitters and, the, and nerves, and I had it today uh, because this, this honor and privilege of speaking to you is so important to me, uh, and I take it so very seriously. I also wanted to begin my remarks by acknowledging so many of the people who are here today uh, who have impacted my career and my education and my formation in the field. And as I began to put those remarks together, I realized that that would be easily 30 to 45 minutes and that would be it. So please um, just accept my, my gratitude to all of you. Uh, to my students, to all of our students, to those of you who were once students and are now uh, alumni, to the practitioners in the field who are a source of inspiration on a daily basis for me, to my colleagues, to our uh, faculty members who did their PhDs here and are now in the world training uh, the next, the next uh, practitioners elsewhere, uh, to our staff members who are our collaborators, our, our partners in our endeavors, and many of whom are instructors and uh, practitioners themselves. All of us make up an incredible community, and I'm blown away by this, um, this crowd. So thank you very much. Um, you know, I research a topic that is not uplifting. It is distressing. And I'm not going to talk about it today, and here's why. We are at a party, <laughs> and I want to have a party, and I, wanted, I want to uplift uh, uh, what we do in, in our careers, at whatever way we cut in, whatever dimension, uh, that, that is the thing that has brought us together and that we share. So, um, you know, I will make some reference to, to that work, probably because I can't help myself. Uh, but, uh, you know, I want to talk about something else, so I hope you'll indulge me, uh, and, uh, and I hope that we can stay light, and uh, you'll know, you know, you'll know when the, the laugh uh, meter is on, okay? Um, so, again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I want to put out today a sort of rallying cry for all of us, uh, wherever we are in the field, whatever point we are in our career, because I believe that, as was alluded to by so many of the remarks that we've already heard, this is a critical moment for engagement uh, of people like us, with the formation, with the professionalization that we have, and with the communities with, with whom we engage. And uh, that's why I entitled my talk, you know, I, I, had, I, I told Anne that I wanted to, to name it something like this. I worried it was too over the top. She said, do it. So our future is now, and that's what I want to share with you. But, you know, this talk wouldn't be complete if I didn't pick on someone a little bit. And here it is, guys. We're going to pick on you two today. <laughs> uh, a few months ago, I was on my way... Um, yeah, I see some people are reading it right now. A few months ago, I was on my way to the, the LibTech conference, which is an event that takes place annually up at uh, uh, McAllister College in, in Minnesota. And uh, just as I got on the plane, this came across Twitter. Uh, the CEO of YouTube, Susan Wojcicki, was at South by Southwest, the annual uh, mega event in Austin, Texas. And in her remarks, uh, she had likened YouTube to a library. I mean, she said it, it's a library, basically. Uh, I was just stepping on the plane, just about to lose my internet connectivity, and I was apoplectic, right, for the next 
for hours. I was um, spinning out. I opened up my presentation that I was going to give at LibTech and added this in. Um, you know, I was ready. I was ready to go. And um, I'm going to tell you how it's not a library. Okay, that's the punchline here, folks. Um, YouTube receives 400 hours of video material per minute, per hour, per day. And that material is primarily sorted, uh, labeled, categorized, and disseminated by anyone want to guess what mechanism? No. By algorithms, right? Yeah, by algorithms. Um, which uh, has come to some uh, profound and cosmically problematic relationships among various types of content. Uh, you may remember during the Parkland shooting uh, incident not long after, a young man who uh, was involved in that found himself at the top of the trending, uh, the trending list on uh, videos that you might want to watch uh, in a video that described him as a crisis actor and a fraud and a phony. Uh, this is the kind of um, uh, information categorization and uh, dissemination that is going on at YouTube. And so I brought this up in my talk at LibTech, and a gentleman in the audience uh, offered his own feedback. <laughs> he came up to the mic, and, uh, and you know, uh, I, I, he really didn't mince words. Uh, he said, sure, YouTube is a library in the same way a pile of unsorted, did not say junk, okay, but we're genteel. Um, thrown on the floor is an archive. To all my archivists out there, I mean, the sweat is breaking out on your brow when you think about that, right? So right, of course they found that preposterous, and LibTech is in fact a, an organization of people who work with, uh, with information systems within libraries and um, are quite technically adept and, and you know, really up on, on their game. So they weren't having it. Uh, in, in fact, if you look at the image from the left, that's a rendering of, of the, uh, the Library of Babel, right, by, by Borges. And so uh, when we think about uh, 400 hours of content per minute, uh, per day going into a system uh, without, uh, without the kinds of principles that, uh, that govern our field and that inform our practice. Um, I think that we can see the point at which the paths between uh, what constitutes a library and what constitutes some other kind of institution or information mechanism uh, are quite divergent. In fact, uh, I found this uh, humorous rejoinder uh, to, uh, to the experience of, uh, of using YouTube for information provision. This gentleman, you know, looking up a video on how to fix a door hinge, suddenly finds himself in this, um, you know, Kafka-esque uh, uh, cycle of being uh, bombarded with uh, hinge, hinge lover videos. Okay. Um, those of you, there are a few folks in here I know who, uh, who were in my in my management class uh, last spring. And you will remember this. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the bibliotheque, a concept for a, for a space in, in Baxter County, Texas. Uh, the bibliotheque, interestingly enough, uh, was going to contain no books. Uh, and uh, any guesses as to what else it wasn't going to have? <laughs> you guys are right, you're right on the money, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's right. You see those like translucent uh, patrons? Well, uh, there's, there, there's unclothed translucent uh, uh, information professionals in this space too, no books, and of course all the information coming uh, uh, through IMAX here, probably from Google, YouTube, <laughs> uh, these information sor sources, right? Um, among the many, many issues that we could bring up around, uh, around going back to this YouTube uh, issue, YouTube as library, uh, the one that, that sort of hooked me in initially and that I actually wrote about uh, in, I guess, what one might call a screed, uh, is, is the issue of privacy and patron privacy as, as we uh, define it and as we um, implement it within our field and how there are key differences in our disposition 
as information professionals to these issues. And uh, those of uh, some, some entity like YouTube, which is of course owned by Google, uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, corporate entities that, that exist at, in our present day. And of course we were discussing at length Facebook, which will not come up here, but let's think about that too. So, you know, the, the, the key difference here between these, uh, these entities uh, is its people, and is its professionals, and it is the orientation that these professionals have to the practice that they undertake, and it is the orientation they have to their patrons, their users, their communities, and the public. And these are things that I don't necessarily think we can claim are embedded and are imbued in a system like YouTube quite the quite the same way. So, you know, again, spoiler alert, CEO Majewski, I don't agree with you. I don't think you are a librarian. I think you better watch it. <laughs> um, so I just want to say a little bit about uh, user privacy as one example or as one way to piece apart uh, these relationships and what we can offer our public uh, that, that other information sources that are corporate, that are profit-driven, are not set up to do, and in fact might be, uh, in fact, engaged in the opposite uh, activity. Does, has anybody ever seen this um, before? Are you familiar with Jessamine West, everyone? Jessamine West, a very well-known uh, public librarian. Um, she, after 9-11, created the signage to let patrons know in their pu local public libraries whether or not anyone was coming from uh, arms of the government to ask about patron records and habits, uh, materials they may or may not have been checking out, and so on. And they weren't allowed, of course, uh, by, the, uh, by these sort of FISA warrants that were being used to gather this information to let anyone know that these, these folks were coming to the library. So she came up with a very clever mechanism to do the opposite. Uh, watch for the removal of this sign, right? So, uh, public librarianship is, of course, uh, the focus here uh, in this context, but I think across the board in our orientation to what we do, we understand a principle of privacy and patron privacy. We usually use the word patron in our field, but we sometimes talk about users and we use other uh, words as well. But patron privacy is key, and it's understood as a tenant that facilitates access to information that facilitates people's willingness to come and solicit uh, things that they want to know about, and that protects them when they do that. In social media, which is where I spend most of my academic uh, research time, uh, the same kind of information that might be generated about user behavior or engagement, those are the kinds of terms that are used there, not only are those collected and, and uh, used and reused and repurposed, but they are actually commodified, and they, um, they themselves can serve as, uh, as currency or as product. These orientations are so fundamentally different that once again, I cannot believe that YouTube would claim to be a library. Um, and in fact, uh, this kind of data mining, this kind of uh, user tracking, and uh, manipulation in many cases to engage users to the end of connecting them to advertisers is the economic engine of the mainstream social media platforms that we know of and use today. So, in fact, we may not only be, not be the customer, but we may be the product in many cases. Uh, that doesn't sound like the library to me, and I'm glad that it doesn't. So, in California, uh, we have uh, particular government code sections that you may know of that ensure the right of individuals uh, to privacy. It's uh, part of the California Public Records Act, and it, there are sections within that act that specifically refer to registration and circulation records. Those very records, for example, that um, in some cases, government entities were, were attempting to solicit uh, following 9-11 and in the, uh, the immediate aftermath of that period of time. Registration records, the patron library card records, circulation records, items checked out, and, and so on, fall under this purview. And many of you may know that because you're responsible to this in your, in your work. In some cases, individual libraries have gone even further than this sort of baseline mandate here in California. 
Uh, San Francisco Public Library's uh, patron privacy be best practices is one example of that. Uh, this is a list of their principles that I find uh, empowering and, and uh, wanted to share with you. So they have an orientation to gathering only the necessary data. Let's think about what YouTube does. It gathers all the data all the time, right? They keep the data only as long as needed, only as long to perform the service or the activity uh, for which it was gathered in the first place. It is not stored in perpetuity. If, if you know about uh, issues in, in the European Union context, for example, you know that the right to be forgotten is an incredibly uh, important uh, part of the, the dialogue right now and the pushback that's being placed on social media companies. San Francisco public, they're going to forget you. That, that right is already there. They're going to keep the data only as long as needed. They limit access to these data to only the people who need it to perform the task. So there's gatekeeping on the, on the data uh, that, is, uh, that is generated in the first place. They secure the data. They secure the data. Did you guys hear about the, the uh, Marriott data breach? Okay, so, right. Best practices there also include protecting the privacy of individuals and their access and use of materials. This is a fundamental tenet. It is a fundamental principle of our field. Uh, and I think it, it, uh, it, it, it can't be stressed enough. So, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about what I wanted to say about the value and the values of our field, uh, the information professions writ large. We've heard a veritable laundry list of the type of work that so many of us are doing that, uh, uh, despite its differences, has this cohesion around, in so many ways, values and principles that we share that may, in fact, have, been, uh, ha have gotten their start in our formation as students in programs like our MLIS program in the Department of Information Studies, for example. It's one of the early places where we encounter that as professionals. Uh, and, you know, these are, this is really just my list, okay? Uh, it's not exhaustive, so please, if you feel like I'm leaving something out, it's, it's just the things that were on my mind as I was, as I was preparing these remarks. Um, LIS education as I just mentioned, is, is often an important starting point for introduction to uh, understanding our roles and our orientations to the profession, to each other, to our patrons, to our communities. Professional organizations as well uh, often develop guiding values and principles by which practitioners undertake their work. Acculturation of information professionals through LIS education and through professionalization in librarianship, archives, records management, knowledge management related uh, positions and, and fields tend to be oriented towards uh, patron and user needs and toward the public sphere and the public good, just like YouTube, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here all week. I would, you know, living in LA, I feel like. I've got to get like my five minute bit. Um, information professionals are trained. Here's one of the, here's like the, the thing I find myself saying all the time when I'm out in the world talking about what we, what we do and how we do it differently. Information professionals, like all of you, like the students who go through our programs, like the faculty who teach, like those of you who are now in the field, we are trained to understand the complexities, the complexities of the interrelationships of systems and infrastructures, informational sources, knowledge creation, knowledge dissemination and provision, user and community needs, the histories of our own practice, the social and political impact and import of the institutions in which we undertake it. This is a complex network web of interrelated uh, institutions and frames, and it is inextricable to the practice. Uh, these are ways of thinking that are <laughs> large scale and pervasive, and I think they're ways of thinking that many of the firms who are encountering problems right now um, could do well to, to, to take a look at. And information professionals, perhaps last but not least, serve as visible and accessible experts and guides to an array of complex informational problems and needs. I think about that particularly in this moment when there is such a concern and a, a sense of confusion, a, a general sense of insecurity and doubt around things like the veracity of the, of the information that people are receiving or the, uh, 
the trustworthiness of a particular information source. Uh, it's, uh, it's provenance. You know, these are the kinds of things that we're trained to think about and that we are trained to help others uh, see. Um, it may start with simply a reference interview that helps a patron reframe the actual question he or she is asking uh, before we even get to the answer. Perhaps the question is a different one in the first place. I, th I thought about that a lot when I was, when I was writing my remarks how that differs from when I need to, say, convert Fahrenheit to Celsius and I type it in the white box and I just get an instant result, right? The, that, that's a great use of an information source like Google, but these complex, uh, multifaceted uh, questions may require more. And I think it's, it's worrisome that we are in, a, in an information culture that has rendered invisible those processes of guiding and asking questions in those ways. So I'm here to say we need to make that more visible and we need to retain and regain our expertise. I think a lot too, of course, about our own mandate within this department. And I think, you know, we've heard about that already today, so I won't, I won't uh, go on at length there, but the fact that this is a department that has a social justice orientation, that's about equity, that's about um, challenging status quo, that's about uh, reframing normative assumptions and received uh, positions and politics, that affect communities of users and patrons is a powerful mandate that I think all of us take to heart every day and we take it very seriously. And I often think about that in the context of my own academic work. Um, I've said this before in, in, in other ways, but the work that I do has to do with, uh, you know, so the origin point of, of my, uh, this is all I'm gonna say about it, I swear. The origin point of my research on, on commercial content moderation was my discovery that there was, a, you know, really a legion of unheralded, unrecognized information workers who labored in obscurity uh, and were uh, sort of masked by uh, received notions that computers could do the kind of cognitive labor that they did, uh, in no small part promulgated by the firms that employed them. I think that my own background as an information worker myself and my uh, education in an MLIS program uh, that has a great resonance with, with our own. I, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison any badgers? I don't know. Um, yeah, we do. Dr. Caswell, that's right. Um, of course. Um, Dr. Lynch as well. I don't think she's here. Um, uh, you know, I think that that's not incidental and it's not coincidental that it allowed me to see. It allowed me to see this uh, area of research. So, okay. I finished the book. I'm really excited about it. I put, I'm putting up a screen of the, of the cover. There it is. Um, and this is all I'm going to say from that book, but uh, what I really want to do here is quote a colleague that so many of us know and respect, who's Shannon Mattern, uh, who has worked uh, on issues of, of uh, libraries and related, uh, related issues for years and is a friend to many of us in the department. And she's been one recent scholar uh, who I cited uh, in my book on this point uh, to remark on the untapped potential of librarians and libraries to serve the public in this age of overwhelming reliance upon digital information, provision, and services. Says Manner in her uh, 2016 fantastically titled Public Information uh, Essay, Online and off, we need to create and defend these vital spaces of information exchange, meaning uh, libraries and other uh, institutions in the public sphere, information and knowledge institutions. And we need to strengthen the local governments and institutions that shape the public use of those spaces. The future of American democracy depends on it, and we cannot depend on tech companies to safeguard those information spaces. Mattern proposes a return to libraries and to the visible, tangible human expert intermediaries who work in them to help us navigate the challenging and overwhelming information environment online and off. And she calls on their integration, as you can see in this quote, into sites beyond the confines uh, of, of uh, the traditional uh, boundaries 
of our practice. So in this essay, which I encourage you to seek out, you know, librarians on the Planning Commission, archivists in the Police Academy, uh, guardians of a critical contextual approach to information. I could not have said it better, and in fact, I did not. That's why I quoted her. <laughs> so, you know, I want to turn for a moment. This is basically the part where I brag about our students, okay? Um, and this is... Uh, this is something I just want to share with you. I, I've had the pleasure just this, this uh, quarter, this recent quarter, to meet up with uh, current students and with recent grads and hear about what's going on in their work lives. And one of the things that I have told students over the years, and I've been teaching, uh, starting you know, TA uh, 10 years ago, I've been teaching uh, future practitioners, it, for a decade, and in that time, I have seen and told subsequent students, when you get a master's degree in this field and you go into the practice, it's a matter of time before you will be having significant impact on the field, especially when you come out of a school like UCLA, and you come out of a, a school with this, frankly, with this pedigree. You are expected um, to step into a role of leadership, whether or not it's uh, you know a management <coughs> position per se, but that is also something that uh, is exciting, and that means that you can um, you can have a you, ha you can have a quick impact. And uh, a lot of my students don't believe me. You know, for those of you who are in here, I know that there's a first order concern, and it's called employment upon graduation, right? <laughs> yes, I know that. And I tell all of you, and I will say it again, and I hope you are talking to each other at your tables, and I hope you uh, had a chance to engage over lunch and. Um, uh, you know, get to know each other a little bit. You will gain employment in this field if you want it. You're going to have it, and you're going to have the impact that you seek and want. But that's what we're preparing you for, and that's what we expect. And that's what I've seen over and over again. So I just want to tell you about a few of those cases. All right, case one, I'm starting out with one close to my heart because I get to do that today. Uh, I had a student who took, on a whim, she took a, a course that I ran last year called Analog Board Gaming in Libraries. She wasn't into board games particularly, but she thought it sounded interesting. It was her last term in school. Um, wanted to challenge herself to learn about something new. She uh, got in touch with me recently to let me know that she's been hired in a public library in a nearby uh, community to LA. And she was hired in part on the strength of a programming proposal that she wrote in this class. Uh, and not only was she hired on the strength of that proposal, but she's now implementing that proposal. And uh, what she was proposing was a community building uh, activity of board gaming uh, it, within the public library. And it's had an amazing impact, including bringing people intergenerationally into contact with each other in that community. It's been an outlet for teens and young adults. And it's also turned into something that's a passion for her. So that's one example in our traditional, um, more traditional public library realm. A second one is that I was recently talking to a student who is doing uh, an internship, which is one of the pinnacles and one of the, the keystones of our uh, MLIS program, as many of you know, and many of you are involved with it. Uh, she's doing an internship right now in a major motion picture studio in LA. Uh, in the entertainment industry. And she's working in, a, in a, a metadata management role. Two years ago, slightly over two years ago, this department was created, and it was the department of one. It was one person was hired. Subsequent to that, they made another full-time hire, one of our uh, soon-to-be grads out of this program. It was my first, the end of my first year here, and one of our students was hired for that position. Just last year, a second, uh, soon to be grad was hired for another position, bringing the total full time employees in this department that had not even existed uh, until very recently to three. They are now hiring for a fourth position, hopefully, from our pool of uh, incredibly prepared students. And they are also uh, bringing on interns from our program. And the student that is in, currently in that internship said to me, I think I found the thing I want to do. This is it. This is the combination of everything that I'm interested in in the field. Uh, one of the reasons for the quick growth of this department is that, as she described it, 
uh, people in this particular studio that is, of course, moving um, primarily to digital assets and needs management, needs to be able to access that for both production purposes, but also for archival purposes, is starting to come to understand the necessity of having professionals organizing the metadata that goes behind that. Case three. Um, Okay, so far nobody's working at YouTube on this list, okay? Case three, <laughs> architectural firm. Uh, we have a, a student who works at an internationally renowned architectural firm in, in Los Angeles and is now, through her studies in our program, leading the way to develop best practices for the records management and archival management of uh, both analog and born, born digital architectural plans, a very specific case with very specific uh, needs. Uh, she's working with plans, drawings, and other architectural outputs that must remain usable and live and live while also being preserved into the future. And um, she is taking up a leadership role and she's taking up an organizational role with other people in a similar position in firms uh, around the country and around the world. Uh, very exciting. We have, uh, I, again, you're going to hear so much more about this later, but I want to highlight a few of these. We have students working um, in numerous museums, cultural heritage and contemporary art contexts, including working as archivists for prominent artists still active in their careers, and working in art galleries to combine backgrounds in archiving and art librarianship, among other skill sets. Uh, we have quite a few of those students. And last but not least, <laughs> That's right, our grads are working on the Prince Archives, okay? <laughs> what can I say? So when we think about redefining the library, we're back to Susan. Um, I'm sorry, no, I don't think that YouTube is quite a library just yet. Uh, not without the guiding principles, not without the expertise, not without the values and trained practitioners that make up our field. And I'm going to argue that I don't think it can be that until and unless uh, these people are visible and making an impact within uh, this company. And I would say as a, as a profession, as a community, as people invested uh, in this field, we. We should not cede. We should not cede this role easily. We should not let it go down like that, right? That's why I'm picking on Susan, okay? Because I don't. I'm not giving this up that easily. Now, I think we can repurpose them. I think these are great opportunities. For example, to come up with a talk uh, that says why this isn't so and how it might be different. Um, it's a great opportunity to describe what makes our field, our practice, our educational processes and, and formation unique and so critical, particularly in this moment, to the public good. Uh, there is no time like the present in so many ways um, to undertake advocacy for these institutions that are critical. And so I think that must remain a priority for us all. I believe, too, that we must enact and ensure our commitment to enlarging representation and access to this field. We need a greater diversity of voices and experiences at the table to bring equity and access and a broadening of ways of knowing and understanding information to the fore. This, of course, includes greater inclusion of underrepresented people on racial, socioeconomic, gender and sexuality, uh, ability, and other grounds. And it means shifting and decentering normative privileged positions that are a part of our field and our history and our contemporary practice as well. And finally, I think we need to make a case, an external case and a powerful case for our field, for its value and for its values um, to those that need it. And that may be constituencies that don't realize that they do. But I think more and more as I engage with uh, you know, with social media firms who are frankly in trouble. They realize, in, in many regards, their gaps. They realize that they, they have not, uh, through, for example, engineering or computer science programs, necessarily been exposed to the gamut of, uh, of, uh, of issues that we prepare students for. 
Uh, it seems like a great place for us to step in. It seems like a place where we could provide expertise, and it seems like a place where we could share the kinds of principles that, uh, that are important to us uh, in a broader context. I also think we shouldn't lose our own imagination about what's possible for us. We, uh, we can regenerate and reconstitute and create uh, other, other systems uh, in the guise of those principles as well. It doesn't just mean that we need to give over uh, to the ones that seem like uh, they've always been there and that they're the only game in town. Uh, it really actually hasn't been that long. So let's uh, stay open. And I think we also need to kind of perform this, uh, this you know, for lack of a better word, public relations activity um, across a lot of dimensions. We, we need to go across generationally. We need to go across institutional silos and barriers. We need to go across barriers uh, around practice. So that's one of the things that I think is so incredible about this department. Um, the, the incredible expertise of so many different kinds that is housed in one place. And finally, we need to prepare our students for this incredibly powerful and important mandate. And that's the thing that I try to do, and I know that that's the thing that my colleagues here do as well. That's why our commitment to our students is what it is. And that's why uh, my colleagues are some of the best teachers I've ever known, and I'm honored to be among them. Um, so anyway, uh, okay, I seem to have lost my last slide, but I think I'll leave it there, okay? Um, YouTube is no library, not yet, uh, but we know what they are, and uh, I challenge us all to, uh, to make those principles broad, wide, and impactful and powerful as we can. So thank you. voices and uh, Sarah is definitely one of those voices and she's a very very busy person and we're very lucky to have an opportunity to listen to her today and Sarah thank you so much terrific really terrific work um, I wanted to go over a little bit of logistics um, about this afternoon um, we're going to now break apart, and there are going to be four panel sessions. Um, they're listed in your program. Uh, several people have already said to me that they're disappointed that they're happening simultaneously because they wanted to go to several of them. Um, I, I, we thought that we were you know, being kind to you and that you wouldn't want to sit all day listening to session after session. So I think we will, in the future, try to reconvene these sessions separately at, um, at another time so that you can hear some of the same things again if you miss out on them today. Um, so the, you know, the assumption is that you'll probably go to one or dip in and out of, of some of them. Um, I, I, on my cheat sheet here, it says that we adjusted the schedule um, so that the panels will now start at 2.30, um, so that you would have lots of adequate time to get to the rooms, go to the bathroom, settle yourself in. Um, we might have to run a few minutes beyond that as well before we get started, because we're slightly um, behind time here. Um, all of the panels will be held in... Royce Hall, uh, I think everybody um, knows where Royce Hall is, and in adjacent classrooms, so which makes it a bit easier for you to dip in and out if that's what you want to do. Um, if anybody um, would like or needs transportation, there is um, an electric cart outside, and it will hold five people, and it will take you over um, uh, in as many trips as are needed. Um, the panel sessions are going to last 90 minutes, and then um, there will also be a um, poster session in the um, hallway of Royce Hall with some of the students' work displayed. Um, the last part of our celebration today is going to be a lovely wine and um, appetizer reception in the Powell Library um, Rotunda, which is one of the best places I know for a reception, although again, the archivist in me always is a bit queasy at the idea of food and drink in a library. <laughs> but but, uh, but it is a, it's a beautiful, it's an absolutely beautiful location. Um, I'm told if you want to drink, 
keep your name tags with you because that's what identifies you as being part of this group and not um, uh, some opportunistic undergraduate who's <laughs> under the age of legal drinking. So, so just to remember that we need to do that. Um, that reception will start about um, 4.30 or 5 o'clock. Um, there are um, staff from the development office available if you have any questions. Um, the final thing that I wanted to say was just some more thank yous. Um, to thank all of you for coming today. If this is a lovely event. I know it's a Saturday. I know getting around Los Angeles is always an issue um, every time you're invited to go somewhere. Um, it is wonderful to have the opportunity to have um, current students and faculty interacting with, uh, with our alums and with our emeritus faculty as well. Um, I particularly want to thank the alum who is anonymous, who generously um, donated funds for 25 of our students to attend today oh. as well. So, I also wanted to thank the Dean for spending his time here on a Saturday with us. Um, I wanted to thank all of the people who are um, uh, going to be presenting in the sessions this afternoon. Um, and there are many of you and students, um, alums, faculty. Um, and uh, I also wanted to finally um, add my thanks to the external relations staff for all of that organization of this event. It's been my pleasure to do this twice now, 10 years apart, and uh, they've done a wonderful job. So thank you very much. And so now we're all going to make our way over to Royce Hall.